Despite its name, Fang was an ordinary small town in a northern province of Chiang Mai, situated on the banks of a river. It made a convenient stopover for river traders and passengers throughout most of the year. A few barges, rafts, and sometimes even a large sailboat could usually be found moored at Fang. But all that was long ago, before the creation of the Trial of Champions. Now, once a year, the river is crowned with boats as people arrive from hundreds of miles around, hoping to witness the breaking of an ancient tradition and see a victor in the Trial of Champions. On the 1st of May each year, warriors and heroes come to Fang to face the test of their lives. Survival is unlikely, yet many take the risk, for the prize is great. A purse of 10,000 gold pieces and the freedom of Chiang Mai forever. But to become champion is no easy task. Some years ago, a powerful baron of Fang called Sukhumvit decided to bring attention to his town by creating the ultimate contest. With the help of the townspeople, he constructed a labyrinth deep in the hillside behind Fang, from which there was only one exit. The labyrinth was filled with all kinds of deadly tricks and traps and loathsome monsters. Sukhumvit had designed it in meticulous detail so that anybody hoping to face its challenge would have to use their wits as well as weapon skill. When he was finally satisfied that all was complete, he put his labyrinth to the test. He picked ten of his finest guards and fully armed, they marched into the labyrinth. They were never seen again. The tale of the ill-fated guard soon spread throughout the land, and it was then that Sukhumvit announced the first trial of champions. Messengers and news sheets carried his challenge 10,000 gold pieces and freedom of Chiang Mai forever to any person surviving the perils of the labyrinth of Fang. The first year, 17 brave warriors attempted the walk, as it later became known. Not one reappeared. As the years passed and the trial of champions continued, it attracted more and more challenges and spectators. Fang prospered and would prepare itself months in advance for the spectacle it hosted each May. The town would be decorated, tents erected, dining halls built, musicians, dancers, fire eaters, illusionists, and every sort of entertainer hired, and entries registered from hopeful individuals intent on making the walk. The last week of April found the people of Fang and its visitors in wild celebration. Everybody sang, danced and laughed until the day broke on the 1st of May when the town thronged to the gates of the labyrinth to watch the first challenger of the year step forward to face the trial of champions. Having seen one of Sukhumvit's challenges nailed to a tree, you decide that this year you will attempt the walk. For the last five years, you have been attracted to it, not for the rewards, but for the simple fact that nobody has ever yet emerged victorious from the labyrinth. You intend to make this the year in which a champion is crowned. Gathering up a few belongings, you set off immediately. Two days walk takes you west to the coast where you enter the cursed port Black Sand. Wasting no time in that city of thieves, you buy your passage on a small boat sailing north to where the river Coke meets the sea. And from there you raft upriver for four days until finally you arrive in Fang. The trial begins in three days time and the town is in an almost hysterical mood of excitement. You register your entry with the officials and are given a violet scarf to tie around your arm, informing everyone of your status. For three days, you enjoy Fang's greatest hospitality. 
and are treated like a denim. During the long merriment, you almost forget your purpose in Fang. But the evening before the trial, the magnitude of the task ahead begins to dominate your thoughts. Later, you are taken to a special guest house and are shown your room. There is a splendid four-poster bed with satin sheets to help you rest, but there is little time left for sleep. Just before dawn, a trumpet call awakens you from vivid dreams of flaming pits and giant black spiders. Minutes later, there is a knock on your door and a man's voice rings out saying, your challenge begins soon. Please be ready to leave in 10 minutes. You climb out of bed, walk over to the window and open the shutters. Already people are thronging the streets, moving quietly through the morning mist spectators, no doubt on their way to the labyrinth, hoping to find good vantage points from which to watch the competitors. Walking over to a wooden table on which your trusty sword and shield lie, you pick them up and cut the air with a mighty sweep, wondering which beasts your sword's sharp edge may soon have to meet. You open the door into the corridor and a small man greets you with a low bow as you emerge from your bedroom. Please follow me, he says. He turns to his left and walks quickly towards the stairs at the end of the corridor. Walking through a parting in the crowds, you see Baron Sukhumpit himself standing by the entrance waiting to greet the contender in the trial of champions. You count five others standing proudly in line, their violet scarves displayed for all to see. There are two bare-chested barbarians dressed in furs. They stand completely motionless, legs straight and slightly apart, arms thrust forward to rest on the hilts of their long, double-headed battle axes. A sleek elven woman with golden hair and feline green eyes is adjusting the cross belt of daggers wrapped around her leather tunic. Of the two remaining men, one is covered from head to foot in iron plate armor with a plumed helmet and a crested shield. The other is cloaked in black robes, only his dark eyes showing between the swarms of his black face scars. Long knives, a wire garrote and other silent death weapons hang from his belt. The five contenders acknowledge your arrival with almost imperceptible nods of the head, and you turn to face the exultant crowd for the last time. Suddenly, a hush falls over the crowd as Baron Sukhumbit steps forward, holding six bamboo sticks. You draw one from his outstretched hand, and you read the word. Then the trial begins. The night is first. He salutes the crowd before disappearing into the tunnel and is followed half an hour later by the elf. Next goes a barbarian and then the dark assassin. Next, it's your turn. But before embarking on your adventure, we must first determine your own strengths and weaknesses. You have in your possession a sword, a shield, and a backpack for carrying provisions for the trip. You have been preparing for your quest by training yourself in swordplay and exercising vigorously. To see how effective your preparations have been, dice will be rolled to determine your skill, stamina, and luck scores. Or, if you wish to begin your adventure immediately, you can choose between three ready-made adventurers. First, we'll roll for your initial level of skill. This reflects your sword skill and fighting expertise and will be determined by rolling one die and adding Six.
Next, we'll roll for your initial stamina, which represents your strength. So the higher your stamina score, the longer you will survive. This will be determined by rolling two dice and adding 12. Next, we'll roll for your initial luck, which represents how lucky an adventurer you are. Luck and magic are facts of life in the fantasy world you're about to explore. This is determined by rolling one die and adding six. You may also take a magical potion with you to aid you on your quest. Each bottle of potion contains two measures, so it can be used twice during an adventure. You can choose from a potion of skill that restores your skill points to their initial amount, a potion of strength that restores your stamina points to their initial amount, or a potion of fortune that not only restores your luck points to their initial amount, but will also increase your initial luck score by one each time it's used. Lastly, before you begin your quest, you are given enough provisions for 10 meals. When you eat a meal, your stamina score will increase by four points. But don't forget, your stamina can never exceed the initial amounts you've just set. You have a long way to go, so use your provisions wisely. During your adventure, you'll enter into combat a number of times, and the further you go, the tougher your opponents will be. Combat takes place over several rounds and your attack strength is based on yours and your enemy's skill scores. For each round of battle, we'll roll two dice for you and two for your opponent, adding the results to your skill scores. These are your respective attack strengths. Whoever's attack strength is the highest wins that round of combat. If you both had the same attack strength in a round, then it will be a tie. In some battles, you can take an opportunity to escape. But beware. If you do run away, your opponent will automatically score one hit on you as you flee, costing you two stamina points. So be sure you have enough. Such is the price of cowardice. You are playing using the new battle system where the battle takes place over three rounds. Your sheer battle-hardened nature will mean you'll always win the battle after the three rounds, but every round you lose will cost you two stamina points. So be careful. Losing all your stamina will still be fatal. At the start of each round, you'll have a short time to decide to fight or to build up your stamina by eating your provisions or taking a potion, if you have one. You are playing using the traditional battle system from the original Death Trap Dungeon book. At the start of each round, you'll have a short time to decide to fight or to build up your stamina by eating your provisions or taking a potion, if you have one. After each battle round, you'll be able to test your luck. By using luck in battles, you can either score a more serious wound on your opponent or minimize the effects of a wound scored on you. If you test your luck after you have just wounded your opponent, we'll roll two dice, and if the total is the same or less than your current luck score, you will have been lucky and will take an extra two points from your opponent's stamina. But if the roll is greater 
then the damage to your opponent will be halved. If your opponent has just inflicted a two stamina wound on you, a lucky roll will halve that damage, but an unlucky roll will take an additional stamina point. One last thing. Testing your luck has a cost. Each time you test your luck, your luck score will be reduced by one point. Now it is your turn to salute the crowd. Holding your violet scarf aloft, you take one final deep breath of cool, fresh air before turning to pass between the stone-pillared gateway into Sukhumvit's corridors of power to face unknown perils in the walk through the mighty Baron's Death Trap Dungeon. The clamour of the excited spectators gradually fades behind you as you venture deep into the gloom of the cavern. Large crystals hang from the tunnel roof at 20 metre intervals, radiating just enough soft light for you to see your way. As your eyes gradually become accustomed to the near darkness, you begin to see movement all around. Spiders and beetles crawling up and down the chiseled walls disappear quickly into cracks and crevices as they sense your approach. Rats and mice scurry along the floor ahead of you. Droplets of water drip into small pools with an eerie plopping sound which echoes down the tunnel. The air is cold, moist and dank. After walking slowly along the tunnel for about five minutes, you arrive at a stone table standing against the wall to your left. On it, there are six boxes, one of which has your name painted on its lid. The lid of the box lifts off easily. and Inside, you find two gold pieces and a note written on a small piece of parchment addressed to you. After placing the gold in your pocket, you read the message which says, well done. At least you had the sense to stop and take advantage of the token aid given to you. Now I can advise you that you will need to find and use several items if you hope to pass triumphantly through my death trap dungeon. Signed, Sukhumvit. Memorizing the advice on the note, you tear it into tiny pieces and continue north along the tunnel where you come to a junction. A white arrow painted on one wall points west. On the floor, you can see wet footprints made by those who entered before you. It's hard to be sure, but it looks as though three of them followed the direction of the arrow, while one decided to go east. Ahead, you can see a large obstruction on the tunnel floor. Although it is too dark to make out exactly what it is, the wet eastbound footprints you have been following carry on towards the obstruction. You see that the obstruction is a large brown boulder-like object. You touch it with your hand and are surprised to find that it is soft and spongy. You clamber onto the soft boulder, half expecting to be engulfed by it at any moment. Getting over it is difficult, as your limbs sink into its soft casing, but eventually you manage to struggle over it, relieved to be back on firm ground. You press on east, 
where the tunnel makes a turn to the left and heads north for as far as you can see. The footprints you are following start to peter out as the tunnel becomes gradually drier. Soon, you are beyond the dripping roof and the pools on the floor. You notice the air becoming hotter and you find yourself panting even though you are walking quite slowly. In a small recess on the left-hand wall, you see a section of bamboo standing on its end. Lifting it down, you see it is filled with a clear liquid. Your throat is painfully dry and you feel a little dizzy from the heat in the tunnel. The water in the bamboo pipe is welcomely refreshing and adds one stamina point. It also contains a magical solution which will enable you to be exposed to melting point temperatures without harm. Discarding the bamboo, you start off north again in good spirits. You find yourself dripping with sweat as the temperature continues to rise. As you struggle on, the heat intensifies until it becomes so unbearable that you feel yourself begin to pass out. Although the temperature in the tunnel is higher than you could normally tolerate, the liquid from the bamboo pipe keeps you alive, and mercifully, after a few moments, the temperature drops rapidly and soon feels almost cool again. On the left-hand side of the tunnel is a closed door. It has a small iron plate in it, which looks like it might slide open. The small plate slides open easily, and you find yourself peering into a room with a deep pit in the floor behind the door. On the opposite wall, there is a coil of rope hanging on one of two iron hooks. The door swings open into the room, and you step back and jump over the pit. You put the rope in your backpack and jump back over the pit to leave the room and head north. Ahead, you see that the tunnel turns sharply to the left. You turn a corner and almost bump straight into two fierce looking orcs armed with morning stars and wearing leather armor. You are totally unprepared for them and struggle to ready your weapon. The orcs roar, and as you draw your sword, one of them swings its morning star at you, which thuds into your arm, knocking your sword to the floor. You must fight them barehanded, reducing your skill by four for the duration of the combat. Fortunately, the tunnel is too narrow for both orcs to attack you at once, so you fight them one at a time. You parry, but your enemy is too fast and you crack your head on the floor as it knocks you to the ground. The orc takes a huge swing directly at your head, but you duck just in time. Neither of you are harmed. You hurl yourself at your enemy, fists flailing, and land a stunning blow. The Orc's Morning Star is a formidable weapon, and you can't stop it smashing into your ankles, knocking you off balance. The Orc runs at you, smashing you painfully into the wall. You drop to the ground, sweeping away the orc's legs. Its head hits the ground hard with a sickening crunch.
You leap forward to grab the orc, but he sees you and pushes you aside, readying his attack. Neither of you are harmed. You duck under the orc's morning star, grab it, and ram its head hard into the wall. The first orc slumps lifeless to the floor, so you turn your attention to the other. You hurl yourself at your enemy, fists flailing, and land a stunning blow. You parry, but your enemy is too fast and you crack your head on the floor as it knocks you to the ground. The Orc's Morning Star is a formidable weapon and you can't stop it smashing into your ankles, knocking you off balance. You drop to the ground, sweeping away the orc's legs. Its head hits the ground hard with a sickening crunch. Your fists are sore from the fight, but you pick up your sword and see if the orcs had anything of use. Inside one of the orcs' pockets, you find one gold piece and a hollow wooden tube. You put your findings in your backpack and set off west. As you walk along, droplets of water again start falling from the tunnel ceiling. Heading west, you see wet footprints made by the same boots that you followed earlier. They lead to a closed iron door in the right-hand wall of the tunnel, but do not seem to go any further. The door opens into a large chamber where you are shocked to see one of your rivals who has obviously met a sudden gory death. It is one of the barbarians and he is impaled on several long iron spikes that are fixed to a frame which has sprung out of the floor. A lot of debris litters the floor, concealing a hidden tripwire which he must have stepped on, releasing the spiked frame. In the far wall is an alcove in which you can see a silver goblet standing on a small wooden table. The pouch on the barbarian's belt is empty, apart from some strange looking dried meat wrapped in a cloth. The meat contains herbs which increase your strength, adding three to your stamina score. The passage soon leads to a junction where you notice more footprints on the floor, possibly as many as three pairs heading north from the south passage. You decide to follow them to where the passage opens out into a wide cavern, which is darker, but much drier. Ahead, you see the footprints gradually fade, then disappear. There is a large idol in the center of the cavern that must be six meters high. In its head are jeweled eyes, each as big as your fist. On either side of the idol stand two giant stuffed bird-like creatures. The idol is very smooth and will be difficult to climb, but the rope you found earlier will help here and you make it into a lasso. You whirl the rope above your head and throw it up at the idol, smiling happily as it lands around its neck. You then tighten the noose and start to climb, hauling yourself up the rope. You are soon at the top of the idol, sitting on the bridge of its nose and holding on to the rope. You draw your sword and wonder 
which jeweled eye to prize out first. As you touch the idol's emerald eye, you hear a creaking sound below you. Looking down, you are shocked to see the two stuffed birds flying off. Their wings flap in jerky movements, but they are soon above you and look set to attack. You'll fight the flying guardians one at a time, but reduce your skill by two during this combat because of your restricted position. You're able to grab the wing of the Guardian and send it crashing into the idol. It recovers, but you took some of its stamina. The Guardian snaps at you with its vicious beak, but you're able to smash the hilt of your sword into its outstretched neck. Coming at you with its razor-sharp talons, you're able to swipe your sword, partially removing one of the Guardian's toes. You're able to grab the wing of the Guardian and send it crashing into the idol. It recovers, but you took some of its stamina. The crumpled form of the first flying Guardian falls crashing to the floor. So you ready yourself to take on the second. The Guardian snaps at you with its vicious beak but you're able to smash the hilt of your sword into its outstretched neck. Coming at you with its razor-sharp talons, you're able to swipe your sword, partially removing one of the Guardian's toes. The beating wing of the Guardian smashes into the side of your head leaving you seeing stars and sapping your stamina. You're able to grab the wing of the Guardian and send it crashing into the idol. It recovers, but you took some of its stamina. Clawing at your legs with its talons, the Guardian rips away a chunk of your stamina. Guardian snaps at you with its vicious beak. You parry, but the tip of the creature's beak sinks deep into your arm. The beating wing of the Guardian smashes into the side of your head, leaving you seeing stars and sapping your stamina. The Guardian snaps at you with its vicious beak but you're able to smash the hilt of your sword into its outstretched neck. Your final swipe dispatches the second flying guardian. You look down and see the crumpled bodies of the two flying guardians lying motionless on the floor. You start to prize out the idol's emerald eye with the tip of your sword. At last it comes free and you are surprised by its weight when it falls into your hand. Hoping it may be of use later, you put it in your backpack. Back on solid ground once again on the cavern floor, you try to shake the rope off the idol's neck. This will be a test of your luck. Remember, two dice are rolled. Equal to or less than your current luck score, you'll have been lucky. Higher than your current luck score, you have been unlucky. The lasso loosens itself and you are able to shake it free of the idol's neck. It falls to the floor with a loud clatter. You quickly coil the rope up again and put it in your backpack. 
wasting no more time in the cavern, you run forward to the tunnel in the northern wall. Not much farther down the tunnel, you come to a closed door on your left. Putting your ear to the door, you listen intently but hear nothing. The tunnel twists and turns, but keeps steadily north. Ahead, you see a thin shaft of blue light streaming down from the ceiling to the floor. It sparkles and shimmers, and you can see images of laughing faces in the light. As soon as your head goes under the blue light, you hear the sound of muffled voices the faces are no longer laughing, but have changed their expressions to one of despair and anguish. A young girl's sad face hovers in front of you, and she begins to whisper a poem. Transfixed, you listen intently, believing that she has a special message for you as she recites, When corridor doth water meet, do not make a quick retreat. Take, Take a, a breath, breath and, and jump, jump deep in, in if, if your trial you hope to win. Memorizing the spirit girl's poem, you step through the shaft of light and quickly head on north. You come to an arched doorway set in the right-hand wall of the tunnel. The heavy stone door is closed, but there is an iron latch and a round handle. The tunnel ends shortly at a junction. Looking left and right, you see a narrow passage disappearing into the dim distance. You walk down the passage and soon find yourself standing at the edge of a deep dark pit. The passage continues east on the other side of the pit. You think you could probably jump over the pit, but you are not sure. There is a rope hanging down from the ceiling over the center of the pit. Taking a step forward, you leap towards the edge of the pit. How lucky are you feeling? Rolling equal to or less than your luck score means you've been lucky, but a higher roll could cost you. Your armor and sword weigh you down, but you just manage to land safely on the far edge of the pit. You waste no time and head east. The tunnel makes a sudden left turn and continues north as far as you can see. You soon arrive at a closed wooden door in the left-hand wall. The door opens into a large candlelit room filled with incredibly lifelike statues of knights and warriors. A white-haired old man dressed in tattered rags jumps out from behind one of the statues and starts to giggle. Though he looks like a fool, the sparkle in his eyes makes you think there is more to him. In a high-pitched voice, he says, Oh, good! Another stone for my garden! I'm glad you have come to join your friends. Now, I'm a fair man, so I'll ask you a question. If you answer correctly, I'll let you go free. But if your answer is wrong, I'll turn you to stone. He starts to chuckle again, obviously pleased with your arrival. The old man points at one of the statues, and you recognize it immediately. It is the knight who started the trial of champions. The agonized look on his face locked in stone for eternity. The old man smiles, saying, This man weighs 100 pounds plus half his weight. How much does he weigh? What will you answer? He 
Still smiling, the old man looks at you and says, Well done, stranger. You have answered correctly. I wish you good fortune during the rest of the trial of champions. And to this end, I shall increase your powers. He then mutters a few more unintelligible words and you feel a powerful surge soar through your body, increasing your skill, stamina and luck by one. You bid the old man farewell and leave his room to continue north along the passage. Only a few meters further down the passage, you see another closed door in the left-hand wall. The letter X is scratched into its center panel. Putting your ear to the door, you listen intently but can hear nothing. The door opens into a large room. Looking around, you see an alcove in the west wall. In the middle of the room, sitting in the chair, is the skeleton of an armed warrior, possibly a contestant from years gone by. The skeletal fingers of its right hand grip a crumpled parchment. Touching the parchment has precisely the effect you had feared. The skeleton lurches forward and rising from its chair in a series of jerky movements raises its sword to strike you. Lunging sideways, you draw your sword to defend yourself. You dodge to the side as the warrior swings its sword. You kick out, knocking its legs out from under it. You raise your sword to parry the skeleton's attack, but it knocks your sword aside and lands a painful blow. The warrior's strength is surprising. You raise your shield to defend yourself, but it smashes you painfully against the wall. You jump back as the skeleton swings its sword, but not quickly enough, and it tears into your shoulder, sapping your stamina. You run around the jerking skeleton, smashing your sword into its arm. The skeleton is strong, but slow. You swing your sword, which smashes into its leg. Once again, you reach for the parchment, only this time lying amidst a pile of broken bones. Unfolding it, you see a map of a room with a drawing of a hideous creature inside it. Beneath the monster is a rhyme which reads, Should you meet the manticore, of its tail beware. Shield yourself against the spikes flying through the air. You fold up the piece of parchment and put it in your backpack, repeating the rhyme over and over to yourself. You walk across to the alcove. At the back of the alcove are some steps leading down into a cellar. Cobwebs brush your face as you descend. The cellar ceiling is quite low and the floor is strewn with debris. In the middle of the wall opposite you is an archway which leads into another crystal lit tunnel. There are large mushrooms growing on the debris to your right. The tunnel continues west for several hundred meters, finally ending at some steps leading up to a closed trap door. You climb the steps slowly, hearing muffled voices above you. In the dim light, you can see that the trap door is not locked.
you throw the trap door open and run up the steps into a bright, lantern-lit room. Two goblins are sharpening their short swords on a stone set in the middle of the floor. You catch them momentarily off guard, but they quickly recover and both rush forward to attack you. A point of note here, adventurer. Because of the shape of the room, both goblins will have a separate attack on you each attack round. However, here your attack will only be effective on one of the goblins. Against the other, you must still use your attack strength in a normal way. But even if your attack would have been effective, you will not wound it. It will just count this as though you have defended yourself. However, if its attack strength is greater, it will have wounded you in the normal way. You thrust your sword and you clearly damage the creature. You both swing for each other and in the confusion, both miss. You try to run around the side of the creature, but it grabs your arm, throwing you hard into the wall. You lunge at the creature's stomach with your sword drawn, but the creature whips around, parrying your blow. Neither of you are harmed. Your enemy is strong, but slow, and screams in pain as your sword sinks into his leg. You hurl yourself at your enemy, fists flailing, and land a stunning blow. You thrust your sword, and you clearly damage the creature. Your enemy is strong, but slow and screams in pain as your sword sinks into his leg. Triumphant in one of your toughest battles to date, you see that the only furniture in the goblin's room is a table, two chairs, and a cupboard on the wall. There are two closed doors, one in the west wall and the other in the north wall. The door opens into another tunnel, which rises gently into the distance. After walking uphill for a while, the tunnel levels out, and you soon arrive at a door in the right-hand wall, to which a withered hand is nailed. There is an open pipe in the right-hand wall, about a meter in diameter. It is too dark to see far down it. You shout into it and hear your voice echoing down the iron pipe until eventually the sound fades away. The pipe is wet and slimy, but you crawl on into the dank darkness slithering and sliding as you go. Suddenly your hand touches something hard and square, which feels as if it is made of wood. It rattles as you shake it, and you decide you must be holding a box. Removing the box lid by the light of the tunnel, you find an iron key and a large gem it is a sapphire. Placing the items carefully in your backpack, you gain one luck point and set off north once again. There is a new branch in the tunnel on your left, and ahead you see two bodies lying on the floor. You stop and peer down the new tunnel, but seeing no doors or creatures, 
you decide against walking down it. With your sword drawn, you walk over to the bodies of the two orc guards. At least one of your rivals in the trial of champions must still be ahead of you. A quick search of the bodies produces nothing, apart from a necklace of teeth around the neck of one of the orcs. The necklace is an amulet of strength which adds one skill point and one stamina point. Pleased with your find, you continue your quest north. The tunnel soon ends at a junction. Standing there alone and wondering which way to go is one of your rivals. It is one of the barbarians. You call out to him, but at first he does not answer. He merely stares at you coldly, his hands firmly gripping his axe. You walk up to him and ask which way he is heading. He grunts his reply, saying that he is going west, and you may go with him if you wish. Although you are slightly uneasy in each other's company, knowing that there can only be one winner in the trial of champions, you are both content to share in the benefits of a temporary alliance. And you begin to tell each other of your exploits so far, of the monsters and traps encountered and the dangers overcome. Walking along, you soon come to the edge of a wide pit. It is too deep and dark to see to the bottom. The barbarian suggests he lowers you to the bottom with his rope, saying he has a torch which he can light for you to use. You tie the rope around your waist and take hold of the lighted torch given to you by Throm, as your barbarian ally calls himself. Taking hold of the slack rope, Throm lowers you slowly over the edge of the pit and down into the dark depths below. You can see by the light of the torch that the sides of the pit are extremely smooth. You drop about 20 meters before hitting the bottom of the pit. There, you see another tunnel heading north, and you call up to Throm and tell him of your discovery. He calls back, saying that he is going to tie the rope around a protruding rock on the edge of the pit and will come down and join you. You hear him climbing down, and soon you are together again. Throm retrieves his rope by shaking it off the rock, and you set off north along the new tunnel. On a stone ledge in the tunnel wall, you see two dusty leather-bound books. Throm grunts his contempt for the written word, urging you to leave the books and hurry on. As you open the book, it immediately begins to disintegrate, the pages turning to dust in your hands. You manage to keep a few fragments and read the handwritten script. The book appears to be about monsters, and from what you can make out, it contains a full description of a monster called the Blood Beast. It is a horrific, bloated creature with tough, spiny skin and facial blisters which burst open to become mock eyes evolved to hide the blood beast's only weak spot, the real eyes. Blood beasts usually dwell in pools of fetid slime which give off a poisonous gas so strong that it alone can easily knock people unconscious. The blood beast, although too bulbous to haul itself out of its slime pool, has a long and vicious tongue which it wraps around its victims before it drags them into its pool. As the helpless and still living victim's flesh decomposes in the vile slime, the blood beast will feed on it. You tell Throm about the grotesque blood beast. He merely shrugs his shoulders and tells you to get going. The tunnel turns sharply to the right, 
continuing east for as far as you can see. Throm stops and tells you to halt as well. He turns his head slowly from side to side, listening. I hear footsteps coming down the tunnel towards us, he whispers. Draw your sword. You both crouch down to hide in the shadows. And not a minute too soon. For a moment later, you see the silhouette of two armed guards. Throm jumps up and dashes forward, screaming a loud battle cry. They are two cave trolls. Throm attacks the first one with his battle axe, and you run to his aid to attack the second. The troll swings low, crashing into your ankles, knocking you off balance. The troll takes a swing at your head, Thankfully, you duck just in time. The troll grabs you by the throat and manages to half choke you before you get a chance to push it off. You hurl yourself at your enemy, fists flailing, and land a stunning blow. You try your luck, and your luck is in. You leap forward to grab the troll, but he sees you and pushes you aside. Neither of you are harmed. You parry the attack, but your enemy is too strong and you crack your head on the floor as you hit the ground. You drop to the ground, sweeping away the troll's legs. It howls as its head hits the hard ground. You try your luck, and your luck You drop to the ground, grab the creature, and ram its head hard into the wall. You try your luck, and your luck is in. You look to the left and see Throm standing over the cave troll he has slain. Blood is pouring out from a deep cut in his shoulder, but it does not seem to worry him. You search the bodies of the cave trolls, but find nothing apart from a bone ring on a leather cord hanging round the neck of one of them. The ring is engraved with a symbol which Throm recognizes. He explains that it must have belonged to druids of the north, and that an ancient talisman such as this will increase your powers if your body is able to accept it. As soon as you put the ring on your finger, your whole body starts to shake. Well, see how skillful you really are. Remember, a roll equal to or less than your skill score means you've been skillful, but a roll higher than your skill could end badly. Your body vibrates wildly and you are unable to stop yourself passing out. As you collapse, you lose three stamina points. You wake to find Throm pulling the ring off your finger. He puts it on the floor and crushes it with the head of his battle axe. Then, grunting to show his disapproval of you, he strides off east. You stand up slowly and stagger off after him. The tunnel leads into a damp cavern with a high ceiling and rock-strewn floor. Long and wet, teeth-like stalactites hang down threateningly. Their constant dripping creates smoky pools on the floor. The tunnel carries on through an archway carved in the shape 
of a demonic mouse. The tunnel ends at a large oak door. Throm wastes no time in testing the handle and is somewhat surprised to find the door unlocked. He pushes it open and walks into a torch-lit chamber. Sitting alone on an ornate chair is a dwarf who bids you enter. As you do so, the oak door swings shut behind you. Adventurers, you have done well to get this far, says the dwarf in a deep voice. However, as you both know, there can only be one winner in the trial of champions. As trial master, it is my duty to Baron Circumvit to let only the most able continue. Therefore, I must devise a test of wits and strength to eliminate one of you. Please do not attempt to dispose of me. It will be utterly pointless, for, as you can see, there is no obvious way out of this chamber, and only I know where the hidden exit lies. Now, if you would care to decide between you who will go first, I shall make the necessary preparations. You look at Throm, suddenly angry, that your effective partnership might come to an end. He leans over and whispers in your ear that you should try to kill the dwarf and worry about the exit later. You tell Throm that there is no point in killing the dwarf, as you will never find your way out of the chamber alone. You argue that an opportunity of tricking the dwarf might arise later, once you have found the exit from the chamber. So you intend to go through with the dwarf's test. You tell the dwarf that you are ready, and he beckons you to follow him, telling Throm to wait for his return. A secret door opens in the chamber wall, and you follow the dwarf into a small circular room. He closes the door behind you and hands you two bone dice, telling you to throw them onto the floor. You roll a six and a two, a total of eight. The dwarf asks you to roll them again, but this time you must predict whether the total will be the same, less, or more. Than the eight. The dwarf congratulates you for guessing correctly. He tells you that you must now progress to the second stage of the test. He reaches for a wicker basket and tells you that a snake is held within it. He tips the basket over and the snake drops onto the floor. It is a cobra and it rears up in the air ready to strike. The dwarf tells you that he wishes to test your reactions. Barehanded, you must grasp the cobra below its head, avoiding its deadly fangs. You crouch down on the floor, tensing yourself for the moment to seize it. This will be a tough test of your skill. With lightning speed, you thrust your hand out and grip the cobra just below its open mouth. You lift it up, and with your arm outstretched, you dangle it in front of the dwarf. He doesn't flinch, but says in his calm, expressionless way, Please put the cobra back in the basket and prepare for the final part of the test. Follow me. You do what he says and follow him back into the chamber, where Throm is pacing up and down, obviously ill at ease. You wave to him while the dwarf opens a second secret door and tells you to walk on through and wait for him. Again, you comply, and you find yourself in another circular room, although this one resembles a small arena. The floor is covered with sand, and a small balcony runs around the arena wall. Opposite the secret entrance you came in through, is an ominous looking wooden door. Suddenly you hear a shout and you look up to see the smiling dwarf standing on the balcony. 
he throws two pieces of paper down to you. On one of them, the words, no crop is, are written. On the other, ruin moat. In his ever calm voice, he says, if you rearrange the letters of the words, you will find the names of two creatures. You may choose which one to fight in my arena of death. Can you identify the creature by rearranging the letters? You call out to the dwarf that you are ready to fight the Minotaur. The wooden door rises slowly and you see the fearsome beast, half man, half bull, step into the arena. Steam blows from its nostrils as it works itself up into a rage, ready to attack. Suddenly it rushes forward swinging its double-headed axe. The swinging double-headed axe is a formidable weapon, and you shriek as it sinks into your arm. The Minotaur swings its axe, but you are fast enough to jump out of the way. You manage to get around the back of your enemy, but it quickly kicks backward, catching you agonizingly in the stomach. The Minotaur swings its huge axe above its head. You step aside as it smashes into the floor. You're able to land an attack from the side. You try your luck, and your luck is in. Your speed is improving. You run directly at the Minotaur and slice at its leg as you run by. You try your luck, and your luck. Minotaur leans forward and takes a run at you. Speed is impressive, but you duck and roll aside, landing a heavy blow on its shin. The dwarf calls down from the balcony, congratulating you on your victory. He throws a sack down into the arena and tells you to relax and regain your strength for the final part of the test. Then he walks off, saying he will return in about 10 minutes. You open the sack and find a jug of wine and a cooked chicken. The food and drink are excellent and you feel much better, gaining two more stamina points. Fully satisfied, you sit down and await the dwarf's return. After about 20 minutes, the dwarf reappears on the balcony. He calls down to you saying, well, I do have an interesting problem on my hands. Prepare to fight your next opponent. The wooden door rises once again, and you are surprised to see a familiar face. It is Throm. He is cut and badly bruised and doesn't seem to recognize you. He is clearly delirious as he staggers forward with his axe, raised to attack you. The dwarf laughs and says, The cobra bit him but he has the strength of an ox and managed to carry on, even though most men would have died. Now you must fight him to decide finally which of you will continue the trial of champions. You shout abuse of the dwarf, protesting the cruelty of such a contest. He merely laughs, and you have no option but to defend yourself against poor Throm. Despite his wounds, he is immensely strong. You parry Throm's attack, but he is too strong, and you trip, cracking your head on the floor as you fall. Throm swings low, crashing into your ankles and knocking you off balance.
Thrum grabs you by the throat and manages to half choke you before you get a chance to push him off. You parry Thrum's attack, but he is too strong, and you trip, cracking your head on the floor as you fall. You grab Thrum around the neck, but he is strong and pushes you up. Neither of you are harmed. Thrum swings low, crashing into your ankles and knocking you off balance. You hurl yourself at Throm, fists flailing, and land a stunning blow on his chin. You try your luck, and your luck is in. Throm grabs you by the throat and manages to half choke you before you get a chance to push him off. You quickly eat some provisions, increasing your stamina by four points. You drop to the ground, sweeping away Throm's legs. You hate it as he howls as his head hits the hard ground. You try your luck, and your luck is in. You parry Throm's attack, but he is too strong, and you trip, cracking your head on the floor as you fall. Throm swings at your head. Thankfully, you duck just in time. Throm swings low, crashing into your ankles and knocking you off balance. You quickly eat some provisions, increasing your stamina by four points. Throm grabs you by the throat and manages to half choke you before you get a chance to push him off. You grab Throm around the neck, but he is strong and pushes you off. Neither of you are harmed. You parry Throm's attack, but he is too strong, and you trip, cracking your head on the floor as you fall. Throm swings low, crashing into your ankles and knocking you off balance. Spending some time alongside Throm taught you some of his moves, and you defended yourself well. But the warrior's skills eventually wore you down, ending your quest right here.